Welcome everyone to the premiere broadcast of Jim and Java. This program exists specifically to answer your fundraising questions. I'm excited about this premiere broadcast and uh, would love for you to continue to submit questions. We've already got questions that have come in. You can submit those to developmenteffectivenessm at gmail.com or on Twitter at devfstrats or use the hashtag Jim and Java. Well, the start of a new year, and we're excited about all that we have in store for us. There's still many challenges that are down the road for us with COVID and whether our vaccines are going to work or not, and uh, whether it's going to be widely accepted within the community. But from the standpoint of fundraising, we still have a lot of things to do, and I'm very optimistic about this year and about all that we have in store for us. I'm hoping that we'll begin to move into a period referred to as a post-COVID period. And so I'm, uh, I'm beginning to plan right now, and uh, without a doubt, uh, wouldn't surprise you to know that most of the questions that we've got for our broadcast today has to do with event plan, uh, whether we can actually hold a live event or whether we have to have another round of virtual events. Well, these are, these are definitely challenging times, and so um, we've got a lot, of, a lot of things to decide, and I'm excited to be able to bring some of the message to you today of uh, some of the things that we've learned. Let's, uh, let's get down to our first round of questions. The first question we have is from Mark in Austin. It says, how effective are virtual events? Do you think we should try for an in-person event in spring or switch to a virtual event? Well, it's, it's a difficult question because every community is different and every community's government has restrictions. Uh, each hotel and every location has different restrictions. But what I'm finding more than anything is I am finding that uh, there are individuals who are willing to get out and are looking forward to getting out. Don't get me wrong, we still have a lot of people that are very concerned and probably won't be looking at getting out of their home and getting out of isolation. I would think to at least June or July. And, um, but I, I can tell you this, that uh, we do have a lot of organizations and a lot of people who want to do an event and that they want to test the waters with their donors. Um, one of the things that we found, all of us, our lives were changed uh, somewhere around March 19th, I know mine was, of 2020, whereas I had about 30 dinners that I had in place for the spring. Each of those dinners had to shift immediately to a virtual event, and that was not an easy process for many of them, and what was a very routine process for me, something that I had done for 36 years, all of a sudden changed on a dime. A word we learned that became quite uh, uh, an important part of our vocabulary was the word pivot. And we learned to pivot and to change on a dime because so often what we had to do was change quickly. And uh, many of us had to move quickly to evaluate our contracts, to find out if we were held to contracts, to find out if we had to, uh, if the hotel was going to hold us to the contracts, and could we get those adjusted to either the fall of 2020 or the spring of 2021, not knowing anything about what the fall was going to be like, and especially not knowing what the spring was going to be like. And so many of us moved into that. You probably were one of those that moved into that. One of the things we really learned was that for that time and place, virtual events really did work well. In no way were virtual events at, at all equal in uh, what, the, what they hope to accomplish from a live event. But we really do believe that uh, I saw a lot of positive things happen from our virtual events. We immediately moved into isolation and there wasn't a lot that any of us could do. And people really were looking for something that would bring them hope and bring them some interaction. And our Zoom calls and our YouTube videos were exactly the remedy that they needed at that point in time. 
and many of you created videos that were uh, according to a lot of the recommendations that I had were 30 minutes long. No speaker was more than four minutes at a time. You included stories of changed lives, but we really, really saw those have a positive effect on a lot of our of our donors and our partners. So that was a that was a good decision that many organizations made at that time. Now income and attendance vary greatly. Uh, YouTube broadcasts saw anywhere from uh, 65 to 150 to 300 to 600 people on YouTube broadcasts for those events. Many of those were the events, the statistics that we kept were that were about 25% of the normal attendance. Now, some had as much as 50, some even had 75%. Uh, income for those events, uh, some were 25%, some were 50%, some were 75%. Uh, I even had some events that did as much as the year before for a live event. The one thing that we learned from those is that they didn't replace the interaction that we had with people, the fellowship, the, the communication at the tables. Uh, those are invaluable things that we lost during that time, and that was, that was difficult to be able to, uh, to not be able to do many of the kinds of things that we do at a live event. But for that season, for that time, it was good. As we moved into the fall, we went there optimistically, thinking that COVID quite possibly was going to uh, slow down and that we were going to see a decline. Uh, but, but unfortunately, many of the uh, dinners that I did uh, also, once again, turned to virtual. Um, very rare. I only heard of about 10 to 15 organizations that actually did dinners in the fall. Now, surprisingly, those organizations had good attendance even in the middle of COVID. Now, again, all this was with social distancing, uh, taking every necessary precaution, keeping anywhere from two to four people at a table. Uh, guests were six feet apart. Tables were exceptionally um, uh, spread apart. Uh, but many of those events saw giving that was equal or more than the year before. Now, of course, attendance was down dramatically uh, for those, but we were able to still see some uh, events uh, that happened. And, and uh, those events really provided good research for a lot of us who do meeting planning and do events as part of their role within fundraising and development. Now, as we get, as we start to look at the spring of 2021, the one thing that we seem to be finding more and more is that people are more willing to consider going out and to test the water to do an event. Now, this is not by any means across the board. I wouldn't even consider doing an event in California or New York or Michigan uh, and, and probably have a lot of difficulty in Chicago. But less restrictive states such as Florida, Texas, California, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Florida, Texas, and South Carolina, all have less restrictions and they are doing much smaller events. Now, the one thing that we know for a fact at this point is that we're not gonna go back anytime soon to having events that were equal to what you had before. If you had an event that was 150, was 200, 500, 700, 1,000 people, we're not gonna get that. But we are seeing some real positive numbers for those individuals who do want to come out. We're seeing some events that are even 50, 60, 75, and 85% of attendance from the year before. Now, what that means is that you are going to have to use all the precautions and all the guidelines of your state and local government. You're going to also have to abide by all the restrictions that your organization may place on there. Uh, our organization happens to be much more restrictive than even local and state governments, but we're working through and working with uh, our organization in those particular situations. But what we're finding is that people are willing to venture out. 
And I live in the state of Florida, and any indication, uh, we, I, it was unbelievable how many people we had from much more restrictive states visiting over Christmas time just because of the less restrictions and wanting to get back to some sense of normalcy. Now again, I don't want any of you to think at all that I'm recommending to take risks with your guests and, and take any risks with the life of your donor. Um, we have found that many of the hotels have been very good about setting up precautionary measures, uh, everything from requiring masks to social distancing to making sure that they are taking added precautions to uh, be touchless in their food preparation and food delivery and also making sure that there are, um, uh, there's, there's plenty alcohol and uh, and um, just disinfectants all over the hotel on every table and uh, every station, of course, bathrooms. And so we're finding that the hotels are really willing to work with us. Now, one of the things that we've found, unfortunately, is the hotel industry uh, is really taking a major hit. And there's probably a good likelihood that those, uh, that industry, the hotel industry, won't be coming back to normal for at least five years. I know a number of individuals that I work with this in sales and catering uh, that are still furloughed right now will be furloughed through April of 2021. So it's, it's really a challenging time for them. But they are, one of the things is that they're willing to work with you and they're willing to make an investment in you. And what that means is that I'm finding a lot of hotels that are willing and are open to giving you some really, really good deals on every one of your, um, uh, you know, just on every one of, of the packages that you have. Uh, I'm finding the contracts are, they're, um, they're waiving the minimum guarantee on some of those, and they're also making sure that um, that uh, you don't have to have to pay for any attrition in those. So uh, those are those are some big incentives because if you uh, if you considered having an event uh, that simply had just your your 20 percent that brought in 80 percent of your dollars and didn't have to worry about any minimum guarantees just paid for the meals for that 20 percent that brought in 80 percent of your dollars um, and you provided a good solid program like you probably have in the past you're going to see some good revenue from that and uh, and it's exciting now again not everyone can venture into that and uh, having a virtual event is uh, is an option for you the one thing that i've found that has been greatly different from March of 2020 is that in, in March, April, May, June, people were looking for something to give them hope, as I mentioned earlier, to um, provide them with a little bit of the outside world. So they enjoyed those Zoom calls. They enjoyed those, um, the uh, YouTube videos that were presented. Unfortunately, as we started to move into the fall, one of the things that became very apparent to us is that people really wanted to, uh, one of the things that we found is that people were so Zoomed and YouTubed out that our attendance on those broadcasts dropped significantly. Whereas the year before or six months before, where, whereas six months before when people were looking forward to watching a broadcast, an organization may have 300, 400, 500 uh, people on a YouTube broadcast. Those similar organizations or the same organizations that came back again were starting to see numbers more like 100, 150, 200 people just because people were not that interested in those YouTube broadcasts anymore. It had lost its luster. It had lost its uniqueness. And if we're seeing that already in the fall of 2020, I can only imagine what it will be like in spring of 2021. So as you venture out and are trying to make a decision on whether you should do a live or a virtual event in 2021, I want you to really consider the fact that um, possibly having a small scale live event may be better than virtual if you're able to do it. But know that there are, I am, uh, once again, I'm not condoning you taking any risk whatsoever or violating any 
government rules, regulations, or policies. I'm just saying that you would be probably would be really surprised to find out how many people are willing to come out and attend an event like that. Now, if you do a virtual event, just know that, uh, again, attendance and know that dollars may be down as well, too. Our next, all right, let's move on to our next question. Our next question is from Mike in Ohio, and Mike asks, how do I pursue development with so much uncertainty with COVID? Well, Mike, I understand. These are, these are difficult times, and uh, especially March, April, May, June, July, and uh, even into August, um, there was just so much that we could not do. I had one major event that had brought in a significant uh, portion of the income for our organization that had to be canceled, and it was a major donor event where we had normally had 100 couples that came in and were willing to give millions of dollars to the organization. Well, that didn't happen in 2020, and we had to shift to be as creative as possible. We did have Zoom calls during that time. We did have phone calls with our donors. Um, as restrictions started to lift in certain locations like Florida and Texas, we were able to meet with those people in an outside setting, uh, wearing masks, keeping six feet apart, obeying all of the, the regulations and rules that are put in place for COVID. Uh, but we did see that individuals were willing to get together with us and, and to meet. Uh, but if nothing else, having the opportunity to have a phone call and a video call with our donors was extremely important. Now, finding new donors in this environment is, has been very difficult because generally people are only willing to meet with people that they know and trust, but also they, they are very, they're cautious about taking phone calls from individuals because it seems in this day and age, there's, there's quite a lot of, of scams and other um, things going on that uh, don't make for, um, for a good, good situation whatsoever. Right. We're finding that where people are in the United States really does matter about their willingness to get together and to meet with people. Uh, I'm hoping that as we start to move into the distribution of vaccines, the more and more people will be willing to travel, the more and more people will be willing to meet with us face to face, and that we can begin to hold more events and begin to have more face-to-face -face appointments. Uh, I've heard of organizations who are having outside gatherings uh, in less restrictive areas, uh, things like golf events. I've heard of dove hunts and quail hunts with major donors to help to build up relationships. Um, if you're familiar with any hunting event, generally you're staying pretty far away from the person next to you. So uh, I would say that in a normal setting, they're obeying social distancing, but especially at this time, they're obeying social distancing and of course wearing masks during all of those uh, events. So yes, development can happen and c development can exist. And uh, I would say continue to just proceed and, pro and process out there as, and uh, get out there as much as you can. Okay, our last question comes from Lindsay in, from Tennessee. Lindsay asks, what should we consider when planning an in-person event in this season? Well, I answered that, uh, or at least parts of that, in a number of the questions earlier. But what I would do is I would, first of all, start out with your venue, find out are they still uh, open? Are they still conducting events? What's the current restrictions? Many are working off 25% of capacity at this point in time. And you'd have to just decide, um, you know, is, is it going to be worth it for you to even venture out? Uh, if you've uh, done events in the past that are 600, 700, 800, 900 people, and the venue can only accommodate 75 or 100, is it going to be worth it for you? I think you need to decide that. If you feel like it would be worth it for you because these are going to be your top 20%, your highest level donors, and getting them together would be valuable, then I would say continue to proceed. What I would do though next is I would do, take a survey of all your partners out there in the 20% category that bring in 80% of your dollars. I would find out who 
is interested in, in coming out to an event. So I wouldn't actually tell them you're going to do an event yet, but what I would do is I would actually ask them if they would be interested in stepping out in faith with you to, uh, to, to, to uh, kind of test the waters a little bit to see if they're willing to uh, venture out there with you. I mentioned before, don't push your partners at all. Just make sure and see if they're, um, you know, something that they, they'd uh, want to do with you. And if those two things work out together, then what I would say is you've got to make sure that you get um, any sign off that you need to do with your organization. Make sure that everyone is abiding by local uh, standards and local procedures. If your event's going to be small, you may want to consider uh, keeping it, uh, keeping the marketing electronic versus going into an expensive um, printing process. I know there's a lot of of, of, of events that I've done over the years where it's the marketing, uh, printing of invitations, printing of save the dates, don't forget, is very worth it if you're going to have 600, 700, 800 people. But if for an event like this, if you can only have 75 or 100 people, you may want to consider just doing personal uh, invites via call and, uh, and, and follow that up with an email onto that. Because of the sensitive nature of this and how emotional COVID is for people, uh, this subject at all, I would really consider looking at calling every one of your 20% to bring in 80% of your dollars and invite them personally to let them know where you're coming from, that you're not about the dollars, that the dollars are not going to override their safety, that safety is your prime concern and that you would cancel the event if anything changed, if things spiked and uh, government regulations changed at a moment's notice, you would cancel the event and uh, make sure that they understand that. Listen to their concerns listen to any frustrations that they've got, and uh, be able to communicate where your heart is, that you're really just trying to continue to maintain momentum, because two years of a virtual event is going to definitely hurt your momentum. And number two, you would like just as much as they would to see them and have have uh, interaction with other people who are like-minded and like our organization as much as we do. So those are the things I would have you consider as you're moving forward with a live event. Well, that's it for our broadcast today, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I would uh, love for you to head out to our email address at developmenteffectivenessm at gmail.com. Uh, hit us up on Twitter at DevFStrats and use the hashtag Jim and Java when submitting your questions. And we'll see you next week.